Good afternoon, dear uh, listeners and watchers uh, all over the place. And the reason I say listeners is because this episode will also become a podcast on uh, Muslimish freethinkers. Welcome to another episode discussing blasphemy uh, laws and the uh, goal of Muslimish of uh, abolishing uh, blasphemy laws, the roadmap. Uh, let me just introduce you to the uh, to a Muslimish as an organization. We all know the meaning of the word Muslim, but what is the meaning of the word Muslimish? Ish in English is a linguistic suffix. Uh, when added to the end of a word, it converts uh, a noun into an adjective and blurs its meaning, uh, taints it with a little confusion, maybe shocks it with some hesitation and doubt, makes it somewhat or a bit as it is. So Muslimish means somewhat a Muslim. That is, it creates an environment for the Muslim individual uh, to question uh, the Muslim individual who have inherited uh, the concept of being a Muslim, but he or she wanted a more loose definition than the one he or she has been accustomed to or brought up as. Uh, one that maybe interacts positively with their intellectual journey, their personal experience, cognitive analysis, and logical skills. Perhaps his or her questioning of Islam or personal understanding of it almost transition him or her to another version of Islam, which is somewhat similar to the Islam they have inherited, or with some of its features and qualities, or even just its smell or culture. Muslimish opens the door to question and encourages uncertainty and doubt in every inherited or accepted the concept that has not been examined by a free conscious mind. Doubt in this case inducts and initiates the question, and the question is the symbol of the movement of the mind towards knowledge. Muslimish erases all red lines before the mind, and the question is the only sacred in Muslimish. It is the means towards knowledge, and if knowledge is endless, then the mean, which is the questioning, becomes also endless in itself. One of the goals of Muslimish is to uh, abolish blasphemy laws across the globe. It also strives to create a safe and supportive and open-minded environment for the exchange of thoughts and ideas among current and former Muslims, also to foster a pluralistic society that respects the rights of all individuals to live according to their conscience. Today uh, with me is uh, the founder and national organization of Muslimish, uh, Ibrahim Abdullah from New York. And also, we have the pleasure yeah. and honor to have Mr. Ali Rizvi from Toronto. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hello, Ali. Ali Rizvi is a Pakistani-born Canadian ex-Muslim atheist and secular humanist writer and podcaster who explores the challenges of Muslims who leave their faith. He writes a column for the Huffington Post and co-hosts the Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment podcast together with Armin Navabi. Ali is also the author of The Atheist Muslim, and he currently started a new podcast. What's the name of it, Ali? Is oh, it's it? called Professional Novice. So I started this Novice. during the COVID times, just so we could uh, just catch up with each other and have conversations like we used to before. So, Great. yeah. Also uh, supposed to be with us, uh, Zainab uh, Khan, uh, She's the founder of Mala. For family, due to family uh, emergency, she is not being able to be with us, but she might join us later. Uh, but to introduce her, Mala is the Muslim American Leadership Alliance. It's a 501c3 civic and community organization committed to promoting individual freedom and diversity and to celebrating Muslim American heritage. Uh, Zainab is a therapist, painter. She's the co-founder of Mala. And she's a human rights advocate born in the U.S. to Asian immigrants. She became an activist after eye-opening experiences, counseling survivors of domestic violence, and organizing exhibitions for artists facing repression. Uh, hopefully, Zainab will join us later. Welcome, both of you, to, uh, to this episode of uh, The Roadmap to Abolishing Blasphemy Laws. And Ibrahim will start us up with the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Sam, for uh, setting everything up for us. And thank you, Ali, for joining us. Um, thank you. Um, this discussion about 
uh, abolishing blasphemy laws, uh, I think is the last step that, you know, in, in the last of the three goals we have at Muslimish, creating a space for discussion, foster a plural society, and the third is abolish blasphemy laws. Um, we have been, we have taken steps uh, to achieve the first two goals. The third goal, abolishing blasphemy laws, is the hardest goal and is a goal that we haven't really taken any solid steps in achieving, except in gathering support through the meetings and gathering support through growing membership and growing awareness. But uh, I, the feeling is that we need to like start taking definite steps and start putting out ideas to achieve that goal. There's, you know, Ali, I actually have been, I've been rereading your book, The Atheist Muslim, you know, in preparation for, uh, you know, having this discussion today. And mm -hmm. um, I, I find it like to be very inclusive of a lot of the arguments and very educational. Uh, the, th the thing that I, I, that I feel like we're still missing in, in our, in our movement, if, if you know, if we're going to, if we can call it that, is mm -hmm. what are we actually going to do to change the laws? We, they're, they're, in my research, I've found some um, work that's been done by different organizations on the UN side. This is really like, I feel like the UN already has the, the, the Declaration of Human Rights, which says there shouldn't be blasphemy laws, but nobody follows that. Mm -hmm. Like we already like so. So what is it? I, I have some ideas, and I'm going to discuss it with you. But I want to, want you to like tell me what do you think? What do you think we should do? What what ideas? What steps we should do to actually achieve the goal of abolishing blasphemy laws where they exist in Muslim majority countries? Yeah, I, I've thought about this a lot, right? So you have, and I think that what we need to do is really move into all of the resources we have now that we didn't have before, mm -hmm. um, and so you know. Maryam Namazi, she's a hero of mine, you know, one of the founders of the movement, a pioneer. Mm -hmm. uh, and her quote that the internet is doing with Islam today what the printing press did with Christianity in the past, mm -hmm. that is really the key to everything. So we have to think about this differently. We, we have precedent. So when you've had monumental changes at this level recently in the last 10, 15 years, what have we seen? We've seen uh, you know, in Egypt, we've seen the fall of Mubarak. We've seen these entrenched dictators that were in power for decades, right? And they've been brought down by mass protests. And these mass protests, how were they organized? They were organized, well, Wa'al Ghanim, right? He organized uh, the yes. Egyptian protest mm -hmm. on Facebook, yes. right? On on Twitter, for instance, in Iran. And, like People didn't really know that there was an uprising against the, the clerical uh, establishment in Iran, right? the hardline government there. Um, but thanks to videos on YouTube and Twitter, we have been able to see what's going on over there in a way that we never did before. Mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up, and I'm I'm an old man, Ibrahim. I'm you know in my in my mid forties. So when I, when I was younger uh, in the eighties, uh, we used to want to know what was happening in Israel and Palestine, and uh, we just saw one side of the picture. I never really knew what the inside of Gaza looked like or you know what was happening in the West Bank and we read about Ramallah we saw Yasser Arafat on TV but that's about it and then suddenly in the last like 10 or 15 years uh, we started seeing these videos things uh, videos straight out of Gaza out of the West Bank and, and getting a side of the picture uh, that we hadn't seen before so there is a what we have to do is we really have to first of all open up our minds and start thinking rethinking uh, the the connection between you know corporate interests versus public interests like in the past in the 80s i remember we had the hardcore capitalists you know where anti-corporations you know the, the sort of uh, a, a leftist ideology and then we had the um, you know the individual person and his his voice isn't being heard now amazingly some of the biggest corporations in the world like Facebook, Twitter, all these social media companies, I mean, they're giants. And for them, the common man's voice is profitable. Yes. Like the, the, the alignment between corporate profit and the advantage of, of uh, every individual's voice has aligned and that line is blurred a lot. So I, I think that that is a starting point. When you think of grassroots activism, 
uh, you think of, you know, we, we used to talk about, well, you know, you're just sitting at home and you're just tweeting on your keyboard and you're sitting in your living room and, and, and Instagramming on your phone. And what does this mean? They had terms like slacktivism, you know, armchair activism. But these things have come full circle. And we found out that this slacktivism actually means, and it's much, much more consequential sometimes than the actual protests. So, you know, again, we saw this in the Arab Spring. We saw that with the fall of, you know, Gaddafi, the fall of um, Ben Ali in Tunisia. We saw that the fall of uh, 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 this guy, uh, Mubarak. Um, so the grassroots activism is a completely different thing. And it's a, an excellent weapon against blasphemy laws. Going about it this way is an excellent weapon against blasphemy laws. Uh, and I will give you an example of uh, my friend, Haris Sultan. So many of us, I, you know, I'm, I've been an atheist from Muslim background. Mm -hmm. He's also an atheist from Muslim background. He's also Pakistani. Um, you know, he lives in Australia, but he decided to start a YouTube channel in Urdu. So all of the things that people in the secular Muslim movement, the ex-Muslim movement, the Muslimish movement, talk about, he decided to speak about them in Urdu to a Pakistani audience. Mm -hmm. Ended up getting tens of thousands of subscribers that are growing exponentially. Um, and he is, again, he's sitting in Australia. So the so Pakistan's blasphemy laws cannot get to him. The blasphemy laws cannot get to Harris, but Harris can get to the audience in Pakistan in their language. Yes. Right? So they're able to reach him. So he is, in a way, in, in a protected position, he's able to say things that activists, our counterparts in Pakistan, are unable to say without fear of their lives. Um, I noticed something similar when I was writing my book is that I heard from prominent journalists in Pakistan. I heard from um, people who were politicians and diplomats who were telling me, that, can you please put this in your book? Make sure you mention this, make sure you mention that because we can't speak about this here. And these are activists who speak up about everything. But this is the one taboo, the blasphemy that they can't touch. And, you know, people like Harris, people like us, we have the power to talk about these things and, and reach those audiences in a way that was never possible before. And this puts the establishments in those countries, and I'm just giving the example of Pakistan, this could easily apply to Arabic and Farsi and, yes. and all of the other languages as well. Uh, the, the advantage of this is that it puts the, um, the establishment there in a bind. Because they can only go so far trying to block videos and trying to block online channels because, you know, it's whack-a-mole. You hit one down, the other one pops up. So they can't stop that. So they can't punish you or throw you in jail or muzzle you in, in any way. They can't stop your speech. So they have two choices. Either they can ignore it. If they ignore it, it just gets bigger and bigger, right? Or they can engage with you. Now, if they engage with you, they have to do it, uh, they either have to engage with you in a very aggressive way in which if I don't want you on my platform, if you're gonna be aggressive with me, I'm like, you know, Harris can say, well, yeah, no, I'm not talking to you because you're coming from a place of bad faith. So not only do they have to engage with you, but they have to engage with you in a, uh, in a, in a respectful way. They have to come from a place of good faith. And this has been happening. So this is just one example with Harris is, is that on his channel, he actually ended up getting one of the most prominent actors, a very celebrity in Pakistan named Hamza Ali uh, Abbasi. He ended up getting him on the show for several episodes and they had several conversations. It turns out that the prime minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, ended up watching a few of those videos, That's as, as far as we know. Yeah. And, and so this is, and Imran, I'm not saying that Imran Khan agrees with Harris or anything, but um, this is a, it's a very, very powerful way to actually just, even while we're in quarantine, even while we're sitting here, you know, using, it's not, it's not uh, a necessarily um, labored activism, but it's smart activism. Yes. It's smart and, and it can get to people. It puts esta the establishments in these countries in a bind. Um, it makes them very nervous that they're losing control of their youth and they're going somewhere else. Uh, and you, you've seen, I, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, Arabic YouTube, like yes. secular YouTube and ex-Muslim YouTube. I mean, it is absolutely- it's and, and, and others. So, well, yeah. you know, I actually like, so a couple of things. I think uh, I think the quarantine has put us, and Wissam says this, quarantine has put us on, on even footing 
with the religious establishment. They right. don't have mosques now. They they still have to use Zoom like us, and that kind of like have made things a little bit equal for a short period of time. And and it's mm -hmm. a good thing we were. I think. And again, I'm going to go uh, to something you said in, in your book, which is like we're a long way from where we were with uh, when the Hispanic Versus came out. Mm -hmm. it's, we, we've seen the change happen, and and the reason I want to like focus on abolishing blasphemy laws is because I feel I feel like it's the next step. I feel yes. like we have been doing a lot in terms of podcasting and 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 social media outreach that, and it's been going on for ten years or more. And it's almost all in the educational side. It's it's from like the grassroots point of view. We wanna we wanna grow a big base that will demand the change. Mm -hmm. I also want to think about going top down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I'm wearing my Slytherin T-shirt today because I'm like trying <laughs> to come up. Well, can we can we like be a little bit more uh, Machiavellian, pragmatic? Can we work with um, with the, the, a secular dictator to try to force the change of blasphemy laws top down? And let me try to elaborate a little bit on that because I know this mm. is kind of a controversial idea. And when I mentioned it before, I uh, you know I, I got a lot of pushback. But I'm not saying it's the right idea. I'm just I, I just like to throw ideas out there, and I want to create that atmosphere where we can just like let's throw some ideas out maybe one of them will be a good one but mm -hmm. in egypt for example the constitution changed three times in the last seven years uh the examples that we've seen where secularism has been implemented whether it's in turkey or you know with at a a long time ago or with you know uh, uh, you know in, in 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 tunisia it's always been it, it, it wasn't always the will of the people. It wasn't always a democratic decision that we're going to move in a secular direction or um, remove a little bit of the religious restrictions on people. This is not something that I see the secular movement even thinking about or discussing at all. And I just want to put it on the table and I, in an attempt to stir the pot a little bit and get some different ideas that maybe they're not, maybe they're not right, maybe they're wrong. Maybe the only reason we put them out there is so we can scratch them and say, no, this is a bad idea. We're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. But I would like to move the conversation towards having solid steps to, to changing blasphemy laws. We had, that, we had that opportunity in Egypt three times in the last seven years. The constitution was changed three times in seven years. Mm -hmm. and, and, all it, and, and that specific part where... Um, having Islam as a sort of legislation, which kind of links to, it's like the second amendment of the constitution It's in Egypt. And it's talking about Islam is a source of legislation. And they spent hours and, 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 and every time they change, they talk about, is it a source of legislation? Is it the main source of legislation? Is it inspir like just the wording of that? How we, and, and that wasn't even in the Egyptian constitution until the seventies when Sadat was trying to push back Against the secular, you know, the not secular, the 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 communist socialist effect of Nasser before him, mm -hmm. and he got the brotherhood out of prison so they can fight the socialists that you know were su supported Nasser, and they ended up killing him anyway. So like, so um, do, is that something that we should talk about? Is it is it something that we can achieve? I know that it would be helpful to somebody. Um, who is fighting, you know, militant Muslim groups, even if they weren't really secular, even if they were trying to appear as secular. So, so I, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah. no, I just wanted a clarification. So you're talking about, uh, what are you, specific, are you specifically talking about doing the kind of thing that Ataturk did or doing uh, like the... Well, uh, we, we're, not, we're not in a position to do that, but I want to be in a position to um, present a strong front to like that that can back these changes like so in egypt for example and this is the, the country that i know most about so i'm going to talk about it the mm. brotherhood were ready when mubarak was toppled to get their agenda in there was no secular organization ready to, uh, to do that yeah to do that uh that's one that's one thing the other is if there's no revolution if, and if it's, it's still going to be the same way that it is can we work as a secular groups in the us and canada with uh, 
with governments in the Middle East that are not democratic governments mm -hmm. to try to abolish blasphemy laws or make the freedoms of speech, the freedom of speech um, restrictions less. Maybe that's something we can do as well. I, I don't know. I'm just yeah. throwing out I, ideas. So I, I think so I think that that's problematic. Just generally, whenever you're working with secular dictators to work on freedom of speech and blasphemy at the heart of blasphemy laws is uh, abolishing them is is the idea of freedom of speech. It becomes a problem. There's a, there's also another issue uh, with much of the Arab world and the, even the Middle East and even countries like Pakistan and Iran and so on um, is that um, they don't think of secularism the way that we do here in the West. So they have a very different association with it, right? So they have, uh, for example, you know, you had the uh, you had the Ottoman Empire. You know, the Ottoman Empire broke down. Uh, you know, the coming of Ataturk forced secularism into it. Um, the a lot of the Arab dictators have been secular dictators, right? They have tried to clamp down on the on the um, the Islamist elements in their countries. Uh, the force the forced installation of the Shah. Right, the Shah of Iran, yes. um, and you know, backed by Western powers, and this was obviously this was a secular um, the dictator as well. Uh, so there is a the association, and this is one of the reasons when you know the Muslim Brotherhood came. You said that they were arose and they were ready to go. They had the agenda. It's mm -hmm. like they'd been preparing for years because they had. Right. So what happens is that when you do force um, or via a dictatorship when you bring in something like secularism first of all people start associating secularism with oppression right it, with, in the minds of people everything's about associations and when you're talking about freedom versus secularism uh, freedom, freedom versus authoritarianism um you want secularism to start being associated with the freedom side right not the dictatorship side so what happens is that when you have these secular dictatorships the powers that rise up against it over the years, the only opposition that actually has uh, the organization and, the, and the, the balls, frankly, to rise up against and, and mount a, a coherent, a cogent a, a, an opposition are these Islamic organizations. So you saw this in Iran way before when the Shah came down, um, that the revolution was actually pretty multifaceted. You know, you yes. had communists, you had feminists, you had seculars, you had everything. Ultimately, the Islamic component won out. Um, in they, Egypt, they, they killed all the atheists. They hung. They did. Yeah, in, in Egypt also, it was a multifaceted opposition. Yeah, it wasn't a Muslim Brotherhood opposition. But yeah. ultimately, the only forces that were organized, and, and the way that they do this is like the Muslim Brotherhood. They're known. They they didn't just get elected because of their ideology. It's because they have an an organized grassroots. Uh, you know they, they're community organizers, so they also help people with with social services. They help them with healthcare. They help them with food. They help them with all of these other things. Yes. So you'd have to think a lot bigger. You would actually have to think like like they do in terms of what they the the, the kind of things they do because they do win out eventually. The opposition against Assad also morphed into a a religious opposition, right? So so when you have um, a secular, when you have secular dictatorships and they've been entrenched for a very long time, then uh, you run the risk of the opposition against dictatorship taking on the Islamist face. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and then that that works counterintuitively. So while in the short term, you know, you might think, and again, in Turkey, we're seeing the same thing with Erdogan. That in, in the short term, it, it feels like a a good solution, a good possibility uh, to work with the dictators to get this done. But in the long term, especially now that everybody has a voice and everybody's on social media and, and people are talking, it makes the work that we're trying to do a lot harder. So I would be in favor of um, using bottom-up approaches uh, and, and, and bringing in people who are influential and this happens, like I gave you the example of Harris Sultan got Hamza Ali Abbasi, who's a celebrity who personally knows a prime minister, you know, so so he can potentially, they can have a dialogue where it's not about, okay, you have to listen to what these people are saying, but, uh, or you have to adopt what these people are saying, but they can say at least, 
well, let's listen. Let's have a dialogue. Let's actually start talking about these blasphemy laws. Um, I, I think that's the way to go. It has to be enduring as well. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Sam? Uh, yes, guys. Sorry, I had to leave a little bit, uh, but I was hearing the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I want to say something, Ibrahim, um, is the I feel that sometimes the terms, especially ones that were most prominent during the 20th century, uh, in today's world, uh, there is a blurring of some of the meanings and definitions. I'll give you some examples. For example, the word democracy, it's, it's, it's a spectrum uh, that uh, when we say democracy or there's a democratic country, we are really not describing a specific thing. We're describing uh, a very general trend. Under it, there might be a various uh, you know, details that are important to the conversation. So I feel that these labels, sometimes they restrict us rather than they restrict the way we're thinking because we have inherited these uh, terms uh, with what, every, with the package, you know, th that that limits what we really want to do. For example, the, if the word dictator, I mean, uh, is Trump a dictator? Yes. You know, is, uh, <laughs> well, no, but technically, actually, no. Technically. Yeah, so so that's the thing, you know, when you come to technicality, technically, uh, Sisi is not a dictator. You know? <laughs> technically, yeah. he's elected. And um, that's the difficulty with this, with these terminologies. Um, but I feel that, I feel that the judges, like when you, when you present what the, the question is, can you support a secular dictator? Or can you seek the help of a secular dictator in abolishing blasphemy laws? Uh, the, the question itself kind of uh, compromises itself by the use of the word dictator. But, but are, are we really concerned of, uh, like, the, does the means just, uh, what do you call the, um, uh, yeah, the justify the means? Justify the means? Yeah, yeah. Or uh, are we really, uh, when we're focused on uh, accomplishing uh, the, the end of blasphemy laws, are we, um, are we pragmatic about accomplishing that? So if an Islamic uh, regime comes into power that will work with us in abolishing blasphemy laws, uh, will we work with them uh, if uh, a regime that is unfavorable to its people? So, and there is a line that you have to draw once it becomes that uh, this, for example, regime is actually causing harm to the people that is, you know, kind of every regime can cause harm, but a harm that you know, you can no longer uh, compromise with. Like but, Assad's harm, like dropping bombs on you know, yeah, civilian people. Yeah. Yeah, even that, even that, even Assad, if you, I mean, especially in Lebanon, uh, it's a very controversial thing. Uh, they tell you that uh, they see that the attempts for a reconciliation uh, as sincere for Assad. Some people have these opinions. Uh, they see that uh, Assad, you know, so there's prioritization in the Middle East, right? Uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, everyone has like a, uh, as shortcomings, but then when it comes to a bigger challenge, so with the bigger challenge of facing Israel, they say that, okay, we'll ignore the small things uh, uh, and we won't uh, attack Assad right now on the, his, his dictatorship because he's standing against imperialism and uh, Israeli occupation, for example. I'm just telling you that this is one of the opinions that are out there. So... Yeah. I feel that when we use that, uh, when we have to, we have to be pragmatic at the end of the day. So since our goals are pragmatic, right? And this is one of our successes. And this is why we've been able, a Muslimish, to have Muslims and non-Muslims and atheists all together because we're focused on the goals, is creating a safe environment for dialogue, no matter what the opinions are. Uh, and, you know, one of them is abolishing blasphemy laws. So we, we don't want any... Uh, uh, courts that will stop uh, people from speaking their uh, their mind uh, that they will you know restrict their uh, expression even if it was uh, blasphemous uh, in the view of religion 
So I feel, I don't know. So how, how do you measure this pragmatism, especially in today's culture? Like you see the complications today. Almost uh, everything comes in a package. Uh, you cannot separate it from each other. And there is a cancel culture and there is um, a lot of sensitivities that's taken into place. Yeah. How do you... Well, I, I, I use the word like, what I mean by democracy is that chosen by the majority of people. That's what I mean by that, you know. Which you know, uh, and I feel that this is a very hard path for us because trying to get the majority of people when we are not allowed to present our ideas is going to be very difficult, even with the internet. And and um, so that's why I was like just trying to think of, and and and, and the reason I'm, I'm I'm putting these ideas out is because I feel in the movement that we have become very idealistic, in a way. Everybody like is 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 talking about ideals that are like like you know superhuman ideals like and 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 everybody has to care about every single issue and uh care about all the causes and support all the causes and, and then, then this this the intersectionalism and all that stuff i don't care i want one thing done i don't want to, i don't care about anything else I'm, I'm focused on one goal and i want one thing done and you know i almost to what to what extent do i not care about the other things and that's really what i want to get the conversation started on do we are are, are we going to keep our high morals on a pedestal and we're not going to discuss anything by someone who's not democratically or chosen by the majority of of of, of people in the population or are we going to say no this is a bad person we can't work with them because they they did this and this and this and this oh yeah i i see what you mean i i think that you do need to work with them if they're in power that's what you have to do there is a, I mean, for the longest time, uh, people used to talk about how the U.S. props up, you know, the Middle Eastern dictators, which it absolutely did. But, um, you know, to some extent, you know, if that's the situation there. You have two options. You either go in and you remove the dictator and you have to build a nation and whatever it is, bring in democracy from outside, which I don't think, uh, you know, what we saw that that doesn't really work very well. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, you can work with them because, uh, you need to work with them. You know, there are people there. So I, I, I agree with you that if there are leaders like that, um, then you should work with them. You should talk about this to pretty much every, every time somebody goes and one of, the, one of our leaders, like, uh, well, uh, Trudeau got in trouble, right? Because he went to Saudi Arabia. He brought up the case of Raif Badawi, mm-hmm. um, you know, that Saudi Arabia cut dem- diplomatic ties with uh, um, yeah. with Canada over you know Krista Friedland's tweet and so on. So th- these these things they do happen. You do bring them up and and you talk to them about it. It doesn't always go as planned, but you can try. I I I'm just not very optimistic that that's going to have a that's going to give you the result you want unless you have the people on your side. And this I think is is the main issue. The main issue, the reason that I I think that the only way to be in a position to have a top-down approach is to start from bottom up. You know, people are susceptible right now to yes. what everybody says. Okay. We are not in a position now where you know corporations can do whatever they want. Now we have if you have you know a million voices on Twitter slamming Ben and Jerry's for something that they did. That Ben and Jerry's is going to be influenced by that. They're going to change their policy because it matters to them what people think of them. The, it, a million is, voices slamming CC. He's still not going to change what he's doing. Well, that's so. There's the precedent shows that he might. Okay, so if you have enough voices. Now, the precedent, unfortunately, is also in Egypt, and the same thing happened in Mubarak, yeah. uh, where there were lots of voices that came up. Eventually, what happens is these militants, I know Egypt has a similar situation like Pakistan, where you know you have you know, democracy, and then you have military dictatorships, and military is always powerful than the civilian government, and uh, more powerful than the civilian government, and so on. So it's a, it's a familiar situation, but eventually what happened with the Mubarak uh, the uh, protests is that, you know, they got people in the military, they got people in the government on their side. You know, they ended up joining the grassroots movement and that actually helped. Um, it didn't really give the dictator much of a choice. Now, would it take several attempts to get that done eventually? Possibly, but you know that it's it's possible. We know that it's possible. We've seen grassroots movements get up and completely change the world, including 
including uh, Islam, the creation of Islam. Right. I mean, that was a grassroots movement. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that's the way to uh, get top down. And right now, uh, we just have a really, really powerful tool right now. With, and th this is the example I was giving you about Harris Sultan. I, I actually want to talk about another thing um, uh, that happened recently. Yasser Qadhi, you know, is, is one of the most uh, prominent Western scholars, yes. uh, Western Islamic scholars. And um, he has become very, very controversial recently because uh, there are you know for a lot of the that uh, lay people the muslim lay people don't really know this but uh, there are many different versions of the quran there are several different versions of the quran uh, that have you know how we're taught that not even a dot has changed not a yeah. single letter has changed uh, simply not true there are entire words there are entire verses there are um a, a different there are 27 even, there are 27 different qurans in arabic Mm -hmm. That you can buy today, in, you know, in, in Arab and, and you, you, yeah. Forms that you can so buy what, exactly. So, so what uh, Abdullah Gondal, who's you know one of these, also another mm -hmm. uh, sort of YouTuber, and and Abdullah Sabir, and these are people now who have tens of thousands of subscribers, and they're only growing, and they've have millions and millions of views on their on their YouTube channels. Uh, they did an entire uh, session on is the Quran preserved, and they went. Uh, line by line, and on on the most recent episode of Secular Jihadists, uh, we spent two and a half hours going through all of the differences between these different Qurans, and these are conversations that are happening uh, that are causing problems. So this guy Yasser Qadi is on a is on a, uh, a YouTube interview with uh, one of the these Islamic Dawa preachers named Muhammad Hijab, mm -hmm. and Muhammad Hijab asks him about it, and his answer was equivocal, it was ambiguous, and he said, "Well, it's complicated." And then he went on to say, he's like, this is not something I want to talk about in public. This is something we talk about in academia because in academia, everybody knows about it. Um, and you know, you can enroll in my course and I'll teach you, but I don't want to talk about this in public. Um, so Muhammad Hijab went and he deleted that entire 30 minutes part of the interview, uh, which was still up on other, other places. Mm -hmm. And it caused an entire fury. And, and this is uh, something that happened because this conversation busted out into the mainstream. This was protected in Islamic academic circles. I mean, it's something that's been known for centuries, okay? But nobody really talked about it in the public because the public narrative was that this is the unaltered, you know, literal word of, the, of, of Allah that has been protected by Allah himself. Well, turns out not so much, right? And um, so, so these, this is a kind of, now, when this comes out, this is obviously something that would be considered blasphemous, but at the same time, people in academia believe in it. And now, now you're talking about, well, should we be able to talk about it or not? Well, these people are talking about it. Can we do anything against them? No, we can't really do anything against them because they live in Canada, but all of our youth is watching this. They're all more and more, it's getting more and more views. So what do we do? We can either ignore it and it'll get more and more and more views, uh, or uh, we have to talk to this guy. Who's doing it? We're going to have to engage him in dialogue. We can't throw him in jail. We have to engage him in dialogue. So let's engage him in dialogue. And then when they engage him in dialogue, the whole thing busts out openly. And, and when that happens, that is the way to get the conversation going. So then, I mean, yeah. So what you're presenting is uh, uh, fighting blasphemy laws by flooding the media outlets with uh, conversations about you know blasphemous conversation using the tools that we have today being able to because you know we can have this conversation on youtube and this conversation this even this conversation would be a huge problem in a lot of muslim majority countries right but but we can do it but and we can reach their audiences if we were having this conversation in arabic or urdu or farsi or malay or indonesian and in any of these other languages um, they would reach the people in those countries in a way that the activists in those countries can't reach it. Um, and that is why you're seeing, you know, as Ibrahim, you mentioned that I, I was talking in my book about how we're long way from what Salman Rushdie, when Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses came out. In terms of years, we're not really. I mean, that was just about 30 years ago. It's 30 years, okay? Mm -hmm. Since then, I remember I saw the Danish cartoons of Muhammad in 2006, and I thought I was shocked. I had never seen it. And I was like, wow, someone actually drew him. And now it's just, it's normalized. No one cares. Blasphemy, in a way, has been normalized. 
I get more sort of, I get more, I remember a time when I used to get death threats every single day. I get more death threats right now, uh, not that many, you know, but I get way more from these, some of these white supremacist types than, than I do from the Allahu Akbar types. I mean, it is, it's a very, very different landscape and it's okay to acknowledge that. I, there are people who say, why are you saying it's still a serious situation? Of course, there is a serious situation. There are a lot of people who are still at great risk right now. As you know, like, for example, Haris Sultan, he had threats against his family that he had to handle. Yes. And the difference is that, that he was able to handle them. And he got those people to apologize to him in public who did this right, by getting law enforcement involved. Um, and things are, if we don't acknowledge that there's been any progress in 30 years, then everything we're doing is useless anyway. Right? And th there has been a massive amount of progress, and a lot of it, the large amount, the the large chunk of it has been because of um, getting online and because of uh, social media, and you know this is what they used to call the lazy tweeting from your armchair type thing. But it's it's something that is actually making waves in a way that none of us could have if we were doing so, it the old way in our country. So, a question, Ali, if you, Ibrahim, uh, if you permit me. Mm -hmm. uh, We've uh, we've been discussing this in Muslimish, uh, uh, and you know most Muslimish members are are non Arabic speaking, mm -hmm. and uh, we've done all our programs in English and focused uh, on uh, English audience. Um, we've attempted to do something in Arabic a couple years in Detroit. We did half of the conference in Arabic and then half of it in English, and created that material. Uh, there wasn't any significant results that encouraged us to do uh, to do this more. Um, and recently we've done uh, the interview with Muhammad Hisham. We mm -hmm. gave him the opportunity to answer uh, the interview questions that he got cocked, kicked out from in mm -hmm. Egypt. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I missed that. I have to see it. Yeah. We played it piece by piece, the 16-minute interview that he was live. We played it piece by piece, and we gave him the opportunity to, uh, to comment. And it took two hours to do that. But also, we haven't, we haven't, we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of views on the promotion. We had like twenty five thousand views on the promotion, and hundreds of comments on Instagram and uh, Facebook. Most of it uh, are hate comments, but we didn't have really participation in viewing the the show when uh -huh. we had it. So what I'm saying is, we haven't had a lot of encouragement to do programs in Arabic, but according to what you're saying, and the Harris Sultan experiment, uh, and what Elishba is doing also in, in, in uh, Urdu, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you encourage Muslims to do Arabic programs, more Arabic programming for the Arab world? I do. Yeah, I think that, and uh, you know, your experience, it, not, it doesn't always hit immediately so for example the abdullah gondal view of the, the opinion the example i was giving you about him you know pointing out all of the different uh differences in the different qurans so he he did this video called is a quran preserved it was actually a powerpoint preservation uh, a presentation with the um you know screenshots of the different verses and so on and he did this in 2018 and you know it was slow it didn't really catch on that much but now this whole thing has exploded uh, sometimes it it takes a while for these conversations to really get out there, and and you have to uh, keep on trying. I mean, all of us started, you know. I I know that there were articles that I wrote back when I didn't have any platforms that barely got any traction. So I thought, well, nobody, I guess, nobody cares about this topic. And then I repost it, you know, five years later, when I do have a platform, and suddenly it goes everywhere. So a lot of this really comes down to exposure more than anything else. Um, and, and and I think you know I was talking to Ibrahim about this earlier. You know that Arabic YouTube, Arabic ex-Muslim YouTube, and atheist YouTube is a, is a massive thing. It's it's very it's full of people who are are hafiz, like they they have Qurans memorized. These are people who are sons of imams, and yeah. it's it's absolutely astounding. I don't know the language, unfortunately, uh, so I can't um, enjoy it as much. They're also not burdened by. You know what the people will think will the far right co-opt us or you know they, they don't have to worry about those things yeah. they can just they have their it's far very right different conversation it's very very different conversation completely different and yeah. it's sophisticated um it's smart and it they're really talking about the things that matter and you know i uh, uh, in egypt in malaysia in in uh, turkey in iran uh, people are worried about this they're worried about the rise of atheism in the youth Right, it's it's something poll after poll is showing 
um, how big of an impact it's having. So it, it's just a matter of, you know, you're at the point right now where you're drawing the dots, you're making the dots. Uh, you can connect them later. Yeah. You know, you're not going to be able to connect them immediately. But this is a long term project. I mean, there is a, we tend to like immediate gratification, right? As uh, we, we all do. I mean, this is, yeah. you know, should we do this? But sometimes, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. There are immediate things that you can do. I think activism that is sort of really in your face and aggressive, there, there's a big place for that. The only problem is that if we do something like that and it backfires on us, for instance, you know, a lot of uh, secular Muslims are forming alliances with the far right because they thought the left betrayed them. So now they're going to another platform, which is, I mean, you left a far right ideology, right? Which is, you know, Islamic theocracy mm -hmm. and so on. And now you're moving to another sort of far right platform just because they're giving you a voice. I, ultimately, that hurts. That hurts all of us. It, it hurts us in the long term. So when we look for short term solutions that might seem flashy and they might present some kind of advantage in the short term, um, I think we just have to be mindful about what we want to achieve in the long term. Yeah. That, and, and I think both you and I, Ali, and I think with Sam as well, we're all optimists in terms of we all think like we're going to achieve this goal is going to be achieved at some point in the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it happened. Uh, even even if we don't do anything about it, I think. But yeah. I want to see it in my lifetime, and then that's why I'm. You know, I want to. I want to see something in my lifetime. If, you know, I'm, you know. I, I, Ibrahim, you will. And I, I have to. <laughs> there, there is another aspect of this that, that you have to understand. So Canada had a blasphemy law uh, that was only repealed two years ago. Okay, so until 2018, they had a blasphemy law, but it was never enacted. Nobody really cared about it. It was just sort of like sitting there in the books and, and people that were activists who said, okay, we have to get this out of the books. And they did it two years ago, Canada. Okay. Now, um, what happened ultimately in a lot of these Western countries, like Ireland had one, the US, all of these countries had blasphemy laws is that it was the people who eventually started not taking it seriously. So even though it was still on the books and it shouldn't be on the books, but even though it was still on the books, Ultimately, it was people who decided that, okay, this blasphemy, it's ridiculous. They, people were surprised to even know there was a blasphemy law. So, uh, you know, it, so you can have the opposite situation too. You can go and work with the leaders in Bangladesh, say, you know, we got to get rid of this blasphemy law. So they get rid of the, of the blasphemy law. But the next time a secular blogger is killed, right, the government will say, well, you know, there's no, he didn't, there's no law against blasphemy. He shouldn't have been killed. But at the same time, look, you know, why was he writing what he was writing? So they're okay with throwing them to the mob. And to me, that's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is really the mob. Yeah. is the mob. Okay, so, and, and the way that people think differently. So, you know, you have this contrast. You have official blasphemy laws, but you have a population that really thinks that blasphemy is a ridiculous concept. On the other hand, you have places that have no blasphemy laws, but um, you have this mob mentality that, that completely works as a de facto blasphemy law anyway. Um, right. But so we, we don't want... We don't want to uh, lessen of the importance of the laws too, uh, Ali. Yeah, uh, is, that's why we had it removed in two two years ago. Yeah, in Africa. Michigan, in Michigan, we have blasphemy laws. You cannot take the word of God in vain, in the in the Mich But of course, it's not implemented because uh, in court it doesn't stand against the First Amendment. So I feel I don't know about uh, the Canada's case, but as far as U.S., uh, the the uh, leftover blasphemy laws in the books of, of states, uh, they're not really uh, taken uh, into consideration because yeah. there's a First Amendment that wipes out everything. Uh, but we don't have First Amendments in our, uh, in our countries. And, you know, um, the, at the end of the day, like we are, uh, we know that we are protected in the United States, like for example, United States or Canada, we are protected at the end of the day. Even if there is a mob, you know that the government uh, mm -hmm. will protect you. You know, uh, because you because you have a government that backs your freedom of speech, so uh, that plus uh, the, the 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 grassroots movement together working together, um, I feel it's the optimum uh, the optimum solution. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I th I think that you have to do both, and there were uh, petitions, and and there was a lot of activism that led to 
with the blasphemy law being struck down in Canada two years ago, even though blasphemy is not really as serious a situation here um, when it comes to the population. But um, so, so I think, yeah, it is absolutely essential to have the laws off the books because you know what they do. They, I mean, we've seen this with Trump as well. As they'll take, find all these old archaic laws. Well, maybe we can use this to justify me asking Ukraine for, I don't know what that law he brought out from, I don't know, ages ago. Um, where you know you ask Ukraine for help and research against Biden or whatever, uh, so they they can do that. Anytime you have a a demagogue or some kind of opportunist who comes into power, they can misuse it. And we shouldn't take that for granted either. So uh, I I agree that it it should be on on both fronts. But I do think that we're going to see uh, something in our lifetime. One one of the reasons I'm an optimist is because I've I've I have been doing this for many years, like you guys have, uh, and. I, I've just seen a massive amount of change. I've seen a complete change in the conversation. Um, we've gone from the sort of the new atheism where everybody was uh, trying to raise awareness that there's there are these issues, and now we're at the point where this next generation of activists is actually engaging in conversations, and they're engaging people within the community, and people people know. And I think that's a, that's a massive achievement in just a, in less than ten years. Yeah. Right. We just have to keep on going and not get to uh, just keep the long, the long term goal in mind. Yeah. And, uh, you know, part of the reason we, you know, invited to this conversation is that we want you and others who are thinkers and leaders in the movement to have that goal of abolishing blasphemy laws um, up there and list of goals that we want to achieve. I feel that it's a very important goal and I maybe I'm. You know, uh, I just feel that it's not being talked about enough or it's not being focused about enough. There's a lot of focus on education, educating the general public, which is great. And I think is, is, is you know, in the long term will get the goal achieved. But there is uh, less of trying to work with the powers that are the powers that are ruling in the current moment. Because we, there is like this sort of looking down on them. There is this very high and mighty, very high moral um, general sense in the movement. I feel, and, I, and and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just, you know, I'm I'm the slithering guy here. Yeah, I'm just trying to just like, can we? Is there something else we can do? Can we like be a little less uh, perfect and and get something done? And I feel that it. it in terms of like the ends justifying the means part, I feel like if we change very little in terms of law, it will have very fast effect on people who are living under very difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of really honestly, women's rights and, and, and inheritance laws and being able to even speak about that and, and having, that's, that's going to affect millions of people instantly if we can, if we can get yeah. this change. I think the thing is that uh, we need to talk about it because I, I work in messaging and I work in communications now. And do, one of the problems, I think, when it comes to the blasphemy laws is the way that we talk about it. When we just say blasphemy laws, it seems like this sort of clinical term, this archaic thing. Um, but we people don't realize that blasphemy laws are the reasons that I can't go to the house that I grew up in and visit that place again. It's the reason that I can't go to the school I grew up in and see some of my old friends. Um, I can't visit certain relatives. It's the reason why, well, you know, Rafia, um, who is Rafia Skoui, who is in, you know, is a Muslimish member and a very vocal Muslimish member, why she wasn't able to see her daughter yes. uh, for, for many years. Right? Uh, there is a, uh, one of my really good friends, uh, Sean Tasir, is the son of uh, the governor of, uh, Punjab, the former governor of Punjab, who was assassinated simply because he showed solidarity with a Christian woman in Pakistan yes. who was accused of blasphemy and she was in jail. Asia Bibi was a big case. Yes. So, um, I, you know, there are, there are lives lost because of this. There is a human toll. There are human stories uh, that should be told. And, and this is the same thing. It's like, you know, how do you get people to care about something is uh, you know, they give the classic example of that if you're scrolling through your Instagram feed and you see 
a hospital, you know, we have saying that, you know, we have 200 children with leukemia in the hospital, please donate. Most people will just scroll past. But if you see a picture of this one little girl who's got leukemia and everyone says, you know, this is girl, her name is Fatima, you know, please donate to her. She has leukemia. Loads of people will donate, even though it's just one person, because there is a story. They can connect with the image in an emotional way. So one of the things that I think we need to do is engage not as much because, you know, we tend to be very cerebral and have these conferences and talk about stats and data and laws and uh, principles, but uh, we don't tell enough stories. And we do. We should start. I mean, one of the biggest successes of, of, of Islam was the stories, right? I mean, in all the religions, they use stories, they use art, they use calligraphy, sculpture, music, dance. All these are the kinds of ways that these are that you get people to emotionally invest and emotionally connect uh, to your cause. And when we talk about abolishing blasphemy laws, we, we should bring out these stories of people who have suffered because of blasphemy laws um, and, and and show what the real human consequence of them are. And I, I think that communications wise, that would probably raise a lot more awareness and people connect with it a lot more too. Awesome. Uh, we're coming to an end of the episode. So I'm going to recap uh, what you presented Ali uh, today. Uh, but before that, I want to say that uh, there's a couple conversations that we might have to also, uh, they, they need to take place maybe in future episodes that mm -hmm. are closely related to this issue, is that blasphemy laws is really the, the, the soul of blasphemy laws is an intolerance to other opinions. And uh, sometimes we, we, to, we, we need to have the spirit of tolerance of diversity of opinions. We need to also solidify that spirit because that has to do with blasphemy laws. Uh, you might change the books, but as, as Ali said that at the end of the day, uh, you know, you might be able to say whatever you want, but you might be not invited to speak ever, or you might be, you know, uh, boycotted. So that's another way society can practice uh, blasphemy laws. Only. So maybe the, the concept of cancel culture and the concept of uh, intolerance, maybe also we should we need to talk about it. Yes. Yeah. Um, the spirit behind blasphemy laws, uh, which we suffer from it. Like sometimes we have to also self-critique. Even the, the left, you know, sometimes suffers from that. Um, so at the end of our episode, I'd like to uh, recap the, what uh, Ali Rizvi has presented as some, uh, some of the uh, most important uh, ways uh, as the roadmap to abolishing blasphemy laws. Uh, one is basically producing and carrying these conversations through the, uh, the way of enlightenment of the 21st century for the Muslim world, which is the internet. Uh, flooding the outlets with uh, conversations that are considered blasphemous uh, to a point where uh, governments and laws have to submit to, to change. And second, humanizing the stories behind blasphemy laws because blasphemy laws sound archaic and um, we need to bring that subject into life. How is it affecting our life and why is it important? Is that a good summary, Ali? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good summary. And I, the one thing I would stress enough is that don't let anybody tell you that you are a slacktivist or you're just doing online activism. Online activism has been much more powerful um, than, uh, than, than the real thing now because you're able, we are able to say things right now to people in our countries of origin and get that audience to listen to us uh, without uh, any fear uh, any security concerns, and and we are able to force the establishments there from to engage with us because of our influence. So I think that that is um, this is a, this is a huge channel that we we must exploit as much as we can. Thank you, Ali. Any final words, Brian? No, thank you so much, Ali. And uh, I just you know thank you. I appreciate your input, and I just want to ask you um, to keep that thought in your mind. And um, present it as one of the things that of the goals that we want to achieve. I just want to put it on the agenda of the movement that 
it's not only about educating uh, the general public that there is there is actual law that we need to change. Mm -hmm. And and I I feel that gets lost some way or gets forgotten or gets ignored a little bit. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe because it's my my passion and I and I want to see it everywhere. I feel that way. But uh, I just wanted. I want it to be on your mind as well because you're definitely someone who influences a lot of opinions, and I want it. I want it. I want it in your on your mind. No, I I really appreciate it. this. Actually, gave me a lot to think about because I, as you said, you know, we hear abolish blasphemy laws all the time, but you know, we just t tend to think, okay, well, how uh, how are we going to possibly do that? So this actually made me think about that, the topic itself. So thank you guys for bringing it up. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to our it. listeners. Uh, this uh, uh, video will be available on YouTube and Facebook and a podcast on uh, Muslimish freethinkers. Have a great e evening. Thanks.